welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, Dine and Learn, Inspire Inspection Update Part 3. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon on the bottom right corner of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted. You may submit written questions throughout the presentation, and these will be addressed during the Q&A. To submit a written question, select All Panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and sent. If you require any technical assistance, please send the chat to Event Producer. With that, I will turn the conference over to Mr. Robert Whit Whittington, General Engineer, React Training Coordinator, and Facilitator. Please go ahead. Thank you, Yazi. Once again, welcome, everyone. It's uh, our third time to have this. We're going to try to have them every week uh, leading up to July. Uh, may go into July. Happen them pretty often also. Uh, an update on the first one we did. Back in May, the PDF and the YouTube is in the uh, Dine and Learn in the, uh, on the web training page. Last week is in the queue for the IT people to put it in. So it should be in uh, tomorrow. I was hoping it would be in by now, but it didn't make it or had not made it as of about 10 or 15 minutes ago when I looked last time. So it should be ready by tomorrow, no later than Friday to look at. And I will try to get this one as quick as I can when I get the, uh, the YouTube back and all the other things that I need. Anyway, I hope you're learning some things from this. I know I am. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over or turn it over to Cliff. Good evening, hi, this is Cliff Cornegay, the Standards Lead in React uh, for Inspire. Um, we're going to go into a uh, a little bit of a deeper dive at a higher level of detail on the standards than we did last week. Last week was a more of a high level overview of sort of the core focus of Inspire. Uh, this week we'll cover some of the material that we did last week, but in a more granular level, and then we'll include some standards that we didn't include last week. Um, you know, if you've had some involvement with the contractor, you may have seen some of this. Um, so I'll kick this off. Um, we basically have 58 slides here, um, and there's a chance we don't get through all of this. And if that's the case, uh, you know, we may, we will likely do actually is uh, finish off the, the remaining slides over the next time and learn. Uh, I would highly recommend submitting any questions you may have about anything that we've said or anything that you've seen on these slides in the in the chat box, so we can aggregate those questions. And in the future, we plan to create an FAQ. We also, we've mentioned the past some training aids uh, that we'll have in the future. Uh, so just wanna make sure that we get you know, as many questions as we possibly can answered. Uh, if there's something we haven't thought of, haven't come across yet, wanna make sure we're aware of that. We can get that information together and you know, hopefully answer all those questions in the near future. Um, and just as an FYI, you know, this is not, uh, at least in terms of the inspection process part of this, uh, not the final version of this. Uh, we're still probably at about the 98, 99% mark. So like 98, 99% of this is gonna be accurate. Might be a small, very small portion of it that would be subject to revision uh, in the next few days, but I, I think it's probably at the 98, 99% uh, level on the, on the inspection process part. Uh, if you were here last week, we talked about uh, how there's deficiencies and deficiency criteria and that we would shortly be coming out with the web version. Uh, that web version has the inspection process part, which includes guidance, which is provides you a little bit more of the context and backstory, what we're trying to look for in the standards. Uh, we're gonna go into you know, a bit of detail on that in uh, this Dine and Learn session. Um, so just as a priority, uh, you know, we're, we're looking mostly at health and safety deficiencies. Um, really only looking at items, conditions, listed in the standards. Those are the only things that should be cited. Um, you know, there may be some things that we may not cover. Again, just make sure you put those questions in the chat so we can get to those. Uh, one thing that is important in Inspire that you have to think about that 
uh, you'll be taking more pictures during Inspire than you may have been during UPCS. Uh, we'll have some guidance in the protocol document that we talked about later. Um, we talked about earlier in the previous Daniel Learn. Uh, we talked about that protocol document um, as being, you know, almost like the comp bulletin, but it, you know, it is different in a lot of ways, but it is, uh, you know, similar to how you use the comp bulletin. Um, so one of the things that we'll, you know, we'll roll that out as soon as the attorneys give us clearance on it. Uh, we're still waiting for the attorneys to basically clear our admin notice, uh, which we think we're really close on. Uh, once we've gotten clearance on that, we'll be publishing the administrative notice. Once we've got clearance on that, that gives us the ability to publish our protocol guide. Uh, in that protocol guide, we talk about pictures a lot. Uh, pictures are obviously important. Uh, Want to make sure that when you're taking a picture, uh, it's as self-evident. The picture is as self-evident as it can possibly be. Which basically means when a person takes that picture, a uh, picture should you know, basically explain the condition if it can. Now, we recognize there may be conditions where you know, the picture is just not going to do it. If that's the case, please provide comments in those pictures that help describe the condition responsible for the defect uh, in a specific location. Um, you know, and that could potentially require more than one picture if it takes more than one picture. Please do that. You know, during the demonstration, we've had some pictures that were taken that were so such a close up that we couldn't really tell exactly what it is that uh, you know that you're trying to trying to take a picture of it. Uh, Want to make sure that uh, you know that picture is as self evident as it possibly can be, and feel free to take more than one if you think that helps. Uh, when we basically produce that report at the end of the inspection. We want to make sure that the property, when they're reading the report, uh, it's clear what the picture was taken of, and you know if they're looking at it, they can understand what what condition was cited. But again, we understand you may not always be able to do that, and if that's the case, uh, please put comments in there. Uh, when our protocol is published, we'll have very specific details around uh, what the comments should include, uh, and we'll make sure that that's something that makes sense to the inspector. Uh, we talked about this last week. Want to make sure you're not writing about tenant-owned property unless it affects life safety system or puts the building at risk. Um, and again, life safety system, things like sprinklers, smoke alarms, carbon dioxide alarms, uh, those sorts of items. Um, and, you know, in regards to putting the building at risk, last week we characterized that as something like a lawnmower of gasoline propane container, maybe even some other type of container that contains something that uh, you know, may put the building at risk. Uh, you know, we've seen things like uh, people with uh, fire pits even in their units to make sure something like that is not present inside the unit. Um, and we want to make sure, you know, if there's something that potentially is uh, in a gray area, uh, we'll put some guidance around that in the protocol guide. Might be something where in your professional judgment, not you know, kind of at that borderline, but something that pops up and it's questionable, it might be something we'd handle on appeals by case by case basis. Uh, something that's popped up, we've got some questions about normal path of travel. Uh, outside deficiencies are things that should be cited only in the normal path of travel for the inspector, for the tenant. Uh, those are things like the sidewalks, stairs, playgrounds, pools, parking lots. And just again, to review this, things that are not deficiency, graffiti, peeling paint, uh, peeling caulking, unless it's lead based paint. Overgrown vegetation, now you potentially cite that as a deficiency if it causes an obstruct sidewalk or maybe even a stair or something like that. Uh, scratch countertops by themselves are not a deficiency. They re rendered it unusual, unusable, that's different. Uh, we'll have some additional guidance around that in the protocol guide. Uh, water stains that are not wet, uh, non-safety or security fencing. So we're talking about basically perimeter fencing. Uh, pools by themselves, not a deficiency. So we previously cited non-functioning pools in UPCS, uh, not something that you would cite or conditions at the pools themselves. There are some things around those poles that could be citable, like trip hazards, sharp edges, and so on. Um, Playgrounds by themselves, not citable. 
There could be issues present such as sharp, sharp edges, trip hazards, uh, you know, even potentially something like a structural standard. I'll elaborate on that later. Um, so again, for review from the last session, those are things that we would not cite, but if they create conditions under other standards, they could be citable. So carbon monoxide alarms, you know, one of the most difficult standards to write, um, largely because Congress required us to write a standard that was in compliance with the 2018 International Fire Code. Uh, we talked about this last week. Um, that's something that's difficult to write into a plain language standard, which is something we were committed to doing. Um, we'll have some additional training aids around that. Those deficiencies that you'll see coming out are, you know, obstructed carbon monoxide alarm, uh, carbon monoxide alarm that does not produce a audio or visual alarm when tested. Uh, carbon monoxide alarm is missing, not installed, uh, or not installed in a proper location. Um, so we fully expect the standards to be published at some point this week. Uh, so you're seeing these a little bit in advance of that. Um, so those will be published potentially tomorrow or the next day. Um, and again, that statutory requirement for these came from Congress, which the effective date on that would tell 27. Uh, we'll have some notes in there about the test button. If they're over eight feet tall, uh, you may ask the POA to push the test button. Combination smoke and CO alarms should be evaluated under both the carbon monoxide alarm and the smoke alarm standard. Uh, if the batteries are dead, then the second deficiency above should be cited where it doesn't produce an audio or visual alarm when tested. Um, what's key to this standard and the deficiencies is identifying the fuel burning appliances uh, and fuel burning fireplaces. So when you're walking through the building, the thing that you really need to mentally take note of is where are the fuel burning appliances? Because that determines where the carbon monoxide alarm is required. So um, there may be a little bit of extra work required in this that could be you know, asking the POA like where these are located. And again, we talked about this last week, but examples would be, you know, is there a boiler in the basement that serves the whole building? Is there a water heater in the basement that serves the whole building? Is there a water heater uh, in, or a fuel burning water heater in each unit? Um, or is there a fuel burning appliance in each unit? You know, these are sorts of things you'll have to identify and it helps if you can do that prior to getting into a unit. Um, you know, that'll help you with this process. Um, you know, so those sorts of spaces you'll wanna be aware of, attached garages, uh, mechanical rooms, laundry rooms. Uh, once you've identified where those fuel burning appliances are located, you'll also wanna identify where the bedrooms are located. Uh, so once you've identified those two things, uh, you'll also wanna identify how combustion gases, uh, and the byproducts of combustion gases could flow through into those units or into those spaces. Uh, so those are things you'll wanna take note of as you're walking into the building, as you're walking to the unit, as you're walking in between units. Uh, those are the important sort of mental notes that you'll need to take when you're walking through the building. Uh, later this week, we hope to have published the decision tree that helps you. Uh, that got changed because we are no longer inspecting classrooms in the inside location. Uh, and you'll also note in the standard in the app when you're doing this, that when you're noting this, where they're missing, not installed, or not installed in the proper location, that's only citable in the unit. Uh, so if you're in a unit, you know, and the requirement was for the carbon monoxide alarm to be located somewhere outside the unit, and it's not present in that inside location, inside the building, each unit that's not protected would be cited in that circumstance. So because of the way the statute was written, we've had to develop the standard in a way that the units are cited individually based on whether or not they are protected by the carbon monoxide alarm. So when you're thinking about it, you know, think about it, you're in a unit, there are fuel burning appliances, present at some location, it could be in the unit, could be outside the unit. You know, if you're in a building where the fuel burning appliances are in the inside location and the units did not have any fuel burning appliances on, inside the units, it's possible if they didn't have a carbon monoxide alarm, you know, outside that unit, 
at any location, you could perform an inspection. If there's not a carbon dioxide alarm, you would still be citing every single unit um, under the standard, the way the deficiency is written. And again, that's basically comes from the way that the statute was written by Congress that uh, was required that we uh, that these be installed in a way to protect each individual unit. So to make sure that that's something that's uh, that's clear. Um, we've got some examples here just to think about. You know, we're inside a unit here. Uh, based on the way that's written, you've got some options here. Um, where the fuel burning appliance is outside the bedroom, uh, you could have it installed outside the bedroom there, and that would be sufficient. Now, where you have a bedroom with an attached bathroom, uh, an example here would be a gas water heater that's installed inside an attached bathroom to a bedroom. In this circumstance, you would need a carbon dioxide alarm inside the bedroom. When we have a gas fireplace inside this unit, inside the bedroom, that's where a carbon monoxide alarm would be required inside the actual bedroom. So here we have an example of a furnace, fuel burning furnace, um, could be installed somewhere within that unit um, where the requirement for a carbon dioxide alarm is for the first duct that actually serves the unit. Uh, there could be some circumstances where you would need to install a carbon dioxide alarm in those in multiple locations based on that. Uh, and in this circumstance, this is where you would have two of those. So here we have an example of where the fuel burning appliance based on the criteria, in this circumstance, it's a gas water heater installed in a closet um, that is not in any way attached to, you know, it's not in the unit. Uh, it is basically adjacent to the unit. Um, you can have a carbon dioxide alarm installed inside that closet and that would meet the requirements. So here is an example. We have a multifamily building uh, where there could be a carbon, if that is the only fuel burning appliance in the building, uh, there's a boiler in the mechanical room where the carbon dioxide alarm is installed in that mechanical room, uh, that would be sufficient. Another example, very similar view, well, they're located in the building in a multifamily property where the carbon dioxide alarm is installed in the mechanical room with a boiler. Uh, this would be adequate. All right, so we're gonna jump here to fire doors. Uh, these are the fire door deficiencies uh, that will be present in the final set of standards that are released this week. Uh, so we're largely looking at fire doors that uh, does that do not open, uh, that do not close. So basically, seats in the frame and latches, uh, or issues with the self-closing hardware. Uh, we're also looking at fire doors that have holes, or the assembly is damaged. Um, looking at fire doors that are have gaskets that are or seals or gaskets that are damaged. Uh, or fire doors that have objects present that could prevent the door from closing. You know, largely what we're looking for here, this is something that we encountered in the demonstration. This is something that you'll really want to key in on. Uh, we encountered properties that had door stops uh, that were removable. Uh, so sort of those plastic door stops, or they even had door stops that were attached to the frame, to the door slab itself. Um, or even if they had something in the frame that could do it, that's that's also a violation here. Um, so just to be clear, if there's anything present that would prop this door open, 
uh, that's something that would be citable under this deficiency. Uh, and then something that we really don't anticipate seeing very much, but if there's a missing fire door, you know, that's obviously something that would be citable. Um, so really wouldn't expect to see that very much, but I think in the event that you see it, I want to make sure that you do cite a missing fire door. Um, and the standards will make it clear that there's some circumstances where you'll need to move, basically use your professional judgment, uh, specifically in places like a unit entry door or a stairwell, where you've noted that all the other fire doors, or all the other doors uh, have been labeled as fire doors, or a majority of those doors have been labeled as fire doors. You use your professional judgment to determine that, that you know this door, if it's missing, uh, is a fire door, you could cite it as a fire door, or if the label's pa painted over, that's something you could cite as a fire door. Uh, so in the inspection process, this is the part we'll be coming out with in the next week, uh, uh, potentially by the end of this week, maybe the early beginning of next week. Um, you know, these are the things that we will write in that inspection process. Um, have that information in a web version uh, for each individual standard, uh, and it will go through each, each individual and specific deficiency, and it will detail this inspection process. Um, when you're reading that, this is the guidance that you'll be looking for, for if you don't think the deficiency criteria is specific enough, uh, and that's where you'll find that information that you're looking for. Now, additionally, when we come out with a protocol guide, we'll include this information and potentially some other additional information that will help you understand what it is exactly that we're looking for uh, in the standards with the deficiencies and the criteria. So just a couple of examples here. Uh, we got holes in the door. Uh, that's pretty clear. Uh, we had a door here that would not close. Uh, that's obviously the same door, and that's because it had a defective latch. So there's two right side pictures, basically same same door. Uh, condition there was, you know, basically when we were trying to close, the latch wouldn't actually latch properly. So it just wouldn't close at all. Um, you know, I may also notice here that there's some pretty significant dents in this door. Um, lots of guidance in the, in the standards is basically tell you which deficiency to cite here. If you saw damage to this door that you thought would actually affect its ability to perform as a fire door, then you would have the ability to actually cite that fire door. Uh, and that's, that's something that you'll want to pay close attention to. I think in the professional judgment of an inspector here, if you see dents in that door such that it has created an impression of that size, that's something that we would expect in the uh, basically professional judgment of the inspector that affects the integrity of the fire door. Uh, so that's something we, we would expect to be citable. Uh, talked about this earlier, fire door propped open. We do not want to see this at all. Uh, this is an issue that we found during the demonstration. It was cited frequently. We want to make sure that these are not present on the doors at all. Um, you know, that's an issue if a fire were to develop in this property. Uh, in the event that someone had this propped open, it can easily spread through the stairwells, uh, also spread from one unit to the common areas. We want to make sure that this is a device or an object that is not present on the fire doors. Um, even if it's not propped open, we still want it cited. Uh, so here we're looking at a missing self-closer. Um, this is something that we were aware of that happened frequently during the demonstration. We want to make sure that we don't see missing self-closers. Fully expect those to be cited. We want to make sure that you guys are citing those. Um, yeah, there's some questions I think that are going to pop up uh, about scoring. Uh, scoring notice should be coming out shortly. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at fire doors. Uh, that's something we're looking at closely as not being scored, uh, at least for the first year during the rollout of Inspire. Uh, so to make sure that's something that everyone's aware that we're considering. Scoring notice is coming out soon. You'll be able to read that there. Uh, egress, we talked about this last week. Uh, I want to make sure that this is clear. Um, Exit access or exit is obstructed. 
Again, we're largely talking about here is want to make sure that people can get out of the unit uh, through the front door. Maybe there's another door in the unit. You know, it goes to the outside. That's something they want to make sure isn't obstructed. Uh, we're talking about getting to the means of egress here. Uh, that's it. Uh, so this does not include things like kitchen windows, living room windows, office windows, uh, dining room windows. Those are the things that we are not talking about here. Um, there could be things in there that, that obstruct your ability to get to those. That's double cylinder locks uh, on the unit entry doors, those sorts of things. Those would be citable. Locks that uh, basically need keys, specialized knowledge, those sorts of things. Uh, we would consider those obstructed means of egress on those doors. Uh, so we've talked about this in the past. Want to make sure um, that this is clear. Rescue opening, we're talking about this specifically in the bedrooms uh, and only on bedrooms at the third level and below. Um, there would not be a rescue opening deficiency that's citable on the fourth level and above in any building um, unless, and this is a one caveat, this would only be cited under the fire escape standard or the fire escape uh, deficiency under egress. Uh, potentially, if you have access to a fire escape at a level that's higher than the third floor and it's a bedroom window, if that is obstructed, you would cite that. Um, so I want to make sure that's clear. Uh, and we'll have some criteria that helps uh, help you guys understand this in the web posted version that you'll see coming out shortly. Uh, so for any fire escape access that's obstructed, uh, that's something that would be signable. So in that inspection uh, process part, we'll have information. This is an example of this. Uh, what do you mean by exit access? What do you mean by exit? Uh, what do we mean by a fire escape? Uh, and how it's adjacent to the rescue opening? Uh, these are all things that we will detail in that inspection process part we're publishing here shortly. Um, there is one part of this that is not right, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, displacement of an item or furniture that obstructs, obstructs a mean of egress will not be citable. Uh, or it will be citable a little bit differently, and we'll make this clear on the version that we post here. Uh, what we mean by an item, maybe something like, let's say someone actually uh, fixes something over a window, like fixed bars. Uh, maybe they put an AC unit in there that they fixed in place with some bars or some straps or something like that. That That is the case. But for tenant on furniture, that is not the case. Uh, window AC protocol, that will be finalized soon. Uh, we'll make sure that that's clear so that when you're performing the inspection, you know exactly what we want to do there. Um, but on this highlighted part, there's something there that is not, that part about the furniture is not correct. Uh, give you some examples here of what we consider obstructed. Uh, so if we see something like this where it's permanently fixed in place, you know, that would, that would definitely be obstructed. Uh, so we see this bar that's affixed across there. There's a sheet of plywood that's screwed in place that's obstructed for a rescue opening. Uh, where we see a window on the upper right corner here that has a screw into the, it's basically a slider. Uh, so where that unit is basically fixed in place, that's obstructed rescue opening. Uh, if we saw a window that was a, had an opener, let's say it's a casement window, was cranked opening, we somehow had a padlock on it with a hasp, um, and it's actually attached there, that's something we would absolutely cite as obstructed. Things not to cite, I'll give you an example here. Uh, that's furniture and basically, it's not a bedroom, but uh, that's a living room. You absolutely would not cite that anyway. Uh, so there's stairs here obstructing that on the outside, wouldn't cite that as obstructed. Uh, that piece of furniture, if that were in a bedroom, uh, wouldn't cite that as a rescue opening either. Uh, so on the right upper corner here, uh, we're not citing that because it's a piece of furniture. On the lower left corner here, uh, there's been a question about outside 
egress. Uh, sort of like what's what are we looking for here? So there's sometimes the buildings where the egress you walk from the unit straight to a landing and maybe a set of stairs. That's an example of what we mean by outside egress. Uh, we don't anticipate this being present very often, but for a building like this, where you walk directly out of the unit to the landing and to the stairs, uh, you're likely going to look left or right. If any of those are obstructed, we would be citing those as obstructed egress. Uh, so here's an example that I think we come across frequently, the window bars. Yeah, if that's on a bedroom at the third level and below, that's definitely a citable deficiency. Uh, if it's not a bedroom, not a citable deficiency. Now there's this caveat to that. And again, if for some reason there were a fire escape on the other side of a window that had bars on it that did not open, that's citable. Uh, so for electrical AFSI, we talked about this a little bit last week. Um, so the deficiencies that we've set along the standards, uh, not visibly damaged, and the test or reset button is not or is inoperable. Um, you know, that's something that would be citable. Uh, so let's say it doesn't have visible damage, but you, you know, test reset button is inoperable. Uh, so it's not meeting its functional purpose. Um, so AFCI is not visibly damaged. The test is reset button is inoperable. Uh, this is something that you'll see in the final version of the standards. Again, the test reset button is inoperable. Uh, an unprotected outlet is present within six feet of water source. We talked about this last week. IE, just to be clear about this, IE means that this deficiency in the criteria is limited just to that. Uh, so sink, bathtub, shower, water faucet, toilet, that's it. Uh, so this is another point we'll make in the protocol guide. We use EG, that is for example, and we use IE, that means it is specifically these things. Uh, so you'll have to make sure that that's something that's clear when you're reading through these. You'll want to make sure that you understand the difference between EG and IE. EG is, for example, IE is, is limited specifically to these things. So for a GFCI breaker, uh, you can either use the test or the reset button. Uh, you could also possibly use a receptacle tester. Uh, if you're using the receptacle tester, uh, it's possible that you may need to actually go and uh, reset a breaker if you're doing it that way. Uh, so you could say, you know, again, just to be clear, you can push the test or reset button at the outlet. You can push the test or reset button at the breaker, or you can use the receptacle tester. Uh, if you're using the receptacle tester, you know, you will uh, need to know where the outlet or the breaker is located. Uh, you may need to visually identify where those are located. If you can't visually identify those, uh, ask the uh, property rep that's present. Uh, they'll need to know where those are located. You know, our expectation is that if you manage a property, uh, your panel should be labeled. You should know where the outlets are. The circuit should be labeled. Um, there was a question about this last week. Um, you know, we know that a lot of properties are going to be out there replacing GFCI outlets. Uh, and I mentioned this last week. But as of, I believe it's mid-2015, all GFCA outlets that are manufactured are, have to meet a UL listing requirement. As a performance requirement, that all these outlets manufactured after that date are self-testing continuously. Um, you know, this is something that if any property has installed an outlet since 2015, we would anticipate that they've encountered a GFCI outlet that has been self-testing itself as occasionally uh, during that test, that self-testing process, occasionally was you know, determined that it was uh, malfunctioning or defective, and did not reset itself during the self-test process. Um, and when that happens, we think this is something that's going to occur. They should have encountered it already, as they're replacing new outlets since 2015. They should have already encountered this. This is not a new phenomena. It's not something that uh, we think is just going to be encountered during the Inspire inspection. So, you know, practically speaking, this is something that properties have encountered since 2015, so eight years now. This is not something that's new. Um, so we've limited these locations where they're required. All outlets outside require GFCI protection. 
Uh, we'll make that clear in the web version in case there's any confusion there. Some outlets are wired in series and they have only one GFSA that provides protection to the entire series. Talked about that. Want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Uh, we talked about the message you can use. And any device with an integrated GFCI protection should not be considered GFCI protection for the outlet. So what we're talking about there is uh, if you walk up to an outlet, they've got a hair dryer plugged into it. There's a G, there's GFCI protection built into that uh, plug, into the appliance cord that came with it. We're not considering GFCI protection in the appliance cord to be GFCI protection. Uh, that is not sufficient for our purposes here. Uh, we are not, at this moment, we do not want you to cite any outlet designated for a major appliance, uh, such water heater, HVAC, refrigerator, washing machine, dishwasher, garbage disposal, permanently installed microwave, etc. So there's been a little bit of a confusion come up on this, like uh, does a countertop coffee maker or a countertop microwave count as a permanently installed appliance? Uh, or a major appliance, it does not. Um, you know, so if we encounter to this picture, if you encounter a countertop microwave or countertop coffee maker, this would not be considered a major appliance. Uh, we have criteria in the web version that's gonna be posted shortly that will say, basically it needs to be permanently installed. We put some criteria around that. It'll make it clear what we consider to be a major appliance. And just as a reminder here, uh, we use this term, we use the EG here. Um, that's a distinction between the IE. Uh, we'll have specific criteria in the web version of this under the inspection process that spells out what we're looking for here. Uh, so that, you know, again, permanently installed within the cabinets or walls, uh, countertop microwave doesn't, doesn't meet that criteria. An outlet installed below a countertop within an enclosed cabinet should not be, should not be evaluated. Under this, under the final version of the standards, uh, electrical conductor is not enclosed properly insulated. Should be evaluated under the electrical conductor outlet switch standard. We just put that in there to make sure everyone's aware of that. Uh, damaged GFCI outlet should be cited under the electrical outlet or switch. Uh, inoperable GFCI. Uh, so just be clear on why that's damaged and still working. Uh, inoperable GFCI within six feet of water source is one defect. That's inoperable GFCI. Uh, do not cite under the unprotected outlet. Uh, three prong outlet that is not grounded should not be cited as a deficiency if the circuit is GFCI protected. A non grounded GFCI outlet should not be cited as a deficiency. So seven and eight, seven and eight obviously interdependent with one another. Uh, and again, any medically necessary equipment should not be tested if they're plugged in, or any outlets should not be tested if they're plugged into this. Um, we'll have a direction underneath the protocol that tells you, uh, or it tells the properties how we're gonna handle this. Um, may end up citing these. Um, but at the moment, we're not gonna ask you to test them. Uh, we may end up just making a note of it and then directing the properties to uh, basically confirm with us that these actually work under the right circumstances. Uh, but that will be clear before our effective date. We'll make sure that's clear. So we talked about uh, electrical outlet and switch. Um, visible damage and testing indicates it is not energized. Um, and I want to be clear on this criteria when we say reasonable, ex reasonably accessible. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone's clear on what that means. You can reach it without moving things, dismantling things, any destructive measures, any actions that pose a risk to the person's or property. And frankly, if you cannot reach into it and put your outlet tester into it, you know, just, just don't test it. I um, want to make sure that that's clear. Um, yeah, we fully expect that yeah, if you're testing enough outlets in a unit that are on that circuit, it's likely going to tell us that there's an issue on that circuit. Um, testing indicates three prong outlet is not properly wired or grounded. So for this, you'll need to be able to determine whether or not, uh, if you see a two two slot uh, receptacle, you'll need to be able to test that. Just make sure it's energized. 
uh, you can use a voltage sniffer, you can use, uh, you know, electricians have a two prime tester that gives you a uh, indication of whether or not there's nominal 120 volt voltage there that office also could serve that purpose. Um, so for those, you want to make sure that that is something that uh, uh, you have in your tool pocket, make sure it's something you can use. Um, water is in contact with, let's say, exposed electrical detector. I want to make sure this is really clear. Um, we've got a little, uh, I think, farther in some regards and less farther in others. Um, you know, if you've got damage or missing sheathing, you want to make sure that that gets, that gets cited. Open ports, missing knockouts, missing outlets, uh, switch cover, missing breaker or fuses. These are the things that we're looking for. Uh, any openings or gaps that are uh, larger than half an inch, that's something you want to make sure that you cite. Um, make sure that that's clear. So you'll need a measurement device. Um, something else that we're doing here is making sure that water's in contact with an electrical conductor that you uh, you actually can actually cite that. Um, and that's an active leak, just to make it clear. Uh, not something there's been evidence of previously happening. You need to actively see water actually in contact with a conductor of any type, then that is citable. Uh, and then we also have outlet or switches damaged. Uh, so any portion of visually accessible is something that you have to be able to see and you can access this and you can observe it. Uh, such that you have a concern that it may not be able to safely carry or control electrical current. Uh, so we are, just to be clear on this, a missing or burned out light bulb should be evaluated under the lighting interior uh, standard. Um, you're no longer citing this as an exposed conductor. Uh, the way this is going to be cited is under the uh, basically the lighting interior standard, if it's inoperable or not. Uh, we're also going to give the properties an opportunity to actually demonstrate if the you know if they can screw in a light bulb while you're in the unit, and they can demonstrate that uh, this thing works. It would not be signable. We just want to make sure that they're working. We are no longer concerned about whether or not they're they're present. Um, so for an exposed conductor, I want to uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, so just to be clear, if you have an improper material, uh, that could be anything from paint to caulk to, you know, I think the picture we see for Gilly is like, uh, maybe even something like some tar or something. Uh, we've seen that passed around. It should be evaluated under the overcurrent protection the device is contaminated. Um, want to make sure that's clear. Uh, if you see that foreign material, make sure it gets cited there under the electrical panel. Um, that's where we think that this is you know, potentially going to be cited. Um, other than that, that's 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 your limitation there. Uh, do not cite low voltage wiring. Um, you know, I think frequently you'll come across telephone wiring, doorbell wiring, thermostat, security systems. Those are things that should be I think visible, you should know what that is when you're looking at it during the course of the inspection. Um, you know, a 120 volt wire is different than uh, a low voltage wire. Uh, that should be something you should be able to visually determine. Do not evaluate it under the standard. Uh, if a device is intentionally designed to have a gap or space, we're spe specifically talking about here, um, are electrical panels that have gaps for ventilation um, you know, those are things that we should not be citing. Largely going to see this in multifamily properties uh, where they have those commercial electrical panels where they intentionally have space. Uh, we'll make sure that that's clear when we publish our training guides here in the new future, near future so you know exactly what it is you're looking at uh, if that's something you've never seen before. Um, if you have a missing smoke alarm, uh, cite that under the smoke alarm standard. Um, that is if it has a wiring harness. <laughs> uh, so we'll make a distinction there. Uh, if it has a wiring harness that has a pin connector that would be cited under the missing smoke alarm. It's also entirely possible if you see that, and there is what I would call a, uh, you know, a wiring connection there without a wire nut uh, between the 
wire from the ceiling and the wire to the to the wiring harness. It's entirely possible you've got two deficiencies there. That's the missing smoke alarm and an exposed conductor. Uh, we'll make sure that you're uh, completely familiar with what it looks like. Um, do not cite electrical boxes with openable doors or covers that close and latch if they are closed and latched. That's a little bit different than we, the way that we did that under UPCS. Um, so I think yeah, we had an issue with zip ties. Um, we're not citing missing zip ties anymore. If the door can close and latch, not something that's citable. Uh, if you approach a box, it's not open. You know, you don't see anything. Do not open it. Um, I want to make sure that that's clear. If you walk up to that box, it's closed. You can't see any opening. Can't see into that box. Uh, not citable. So we talked about this a little bit. If it's not reasonably accessible, you should cite that. Uh, we've had some pictures about that in the past. Uh, if you, you know, don't want to move anything, want to dismantle anything, nothing destructive, want to make sure that's clear. Uh, if, it's, if it's damaged, the circuit breaker is damaged, we have a deficiency for that. Uh, you know, visibly, I think in the professional judgment of the inspectors, they should be able to determine that. Um, we talked about contamination here. Uh, so it could be water, could be rust, could be corrosion. If you see any evidence of contamination, and that's also where we talked about those gaps in electrical panels. Uh, Want to make sure that that's something that you could, uh, you know, you're aware of that you should be citing during the inspection. Here's an example of obstructed service panels. So where we've said. Previously, it's not reasonably accessible. You know, these are examples of electrical panels that are not reasonably accessible. Let's see, we have 10 more minutes before seven. I'm gonna try to leave enough time to make sure that we have time for questions. Uh, so fire extinguishers, Fairly close to what we had under UPCS. You know, there's not a lot um, that's changed from that. Um, Want to make sure that there's a note here that people are aware of. Uh, tenant on fire extinguisher should not be cited. Uh, you know, we'll put some criteria around that so it's clear exactly what it is we're looking for there. Occasionally, we'll come across fire extinguishers that have been removed from service. So that's a fire extinguisher that's present in a, let's say a mechanical room, uh, not really a mechanical room, but a service room, uh, maybe a maintenance room where they've removed it uh, because they plan to service. That's something you wanna make sure that you're not citing. Um, if they provided an invoice or report, uh, they can show you that it's been serviced within that time period. We wanna make sure that actually we are not citing those. Um, We have some examples here. We've got a fire extinguisher that's got a tag that's illegible. And we've also got one that's expired. I think those are things that you'll see frequently. Uh, I want to make sure that you are familiar with that. All right, guardrail. Before we get into this, I think I will transition to questions. Um, so I'll take some time here and start reading off the questions, and then I'll answer those as those come up. If uh, the host can help us with those. You there, Yazi? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, let's go through the questions. The first question we have is, do we need to use a pinless moisture meter when doing an Inspire inspection? Yes, that's right. So we have that new elevated moisture deficiency uh, that's going to be under the mold and moisture standard. It is going to be required to be a pinless meter. That pinless meter should be able to determine elevated moisture within the materials that we expect to see within properties. So we're talking about wood, uh, masonry, plaster, those sorts of things. So you want to make sure when you're looking for that moisture meter that it has the ability 
across those material categories to actually measure elevated moisture. Will the Panas uh, Panasonic Toughbook run new software? What computer do you suggest? What computer are um, HUD Q&A using? So I believe the vast majority of QA inspectors are using iPads and iPhones. Um, it will work on the Android operating system as well. Uh, so I believe it's you know, functional on the Windows system as well. So it's, I, mean, I think it should work across all of those platforms. Um, in terms of tough books, um, that I'm not sure of. Um, that's something I'll get back to you on. Because I, th I think we're largely transitioning to mostly iPads uh, within React. How many pictures can be taken of a defect? Can an arrow or circle be editing function part of the software? So less, and again, the app is actually, we haven't talked about the, uh, this a lot yet, but for the app, uh, last time, I checked in development, it's, it's approximately four pictures per deficiency for each individual deficiency. Um, and I think it's going to be probably four pictures on the rollout. Uh, they are working on functionality where you can actually make notations uh, within the pictures. Uh, I'm not sure if that's available on this release or a later release, but that is functionality that we expect to be available in the near future. And that would include arrows or circles or even text. Uh, does a normal path of traveling still include the rear side of building without a sidewalk? Yeah, so under the guidance that we will publish in the inspection process, uh, the normal path of travel is not going to be you know, the area where someone walks across the backyard, uh, maybe they have a dirt path. Uh, it's going to be something that is part of the build. You know, there is a built part to it. So it's it's going to be sidewalks uh, that are constructed with concrete. Could be sidewalks with pavers, concrete pavers. Could be brick pavers. Uh, could be even a gravel sidewalk. You know, it's going to be have to, it's going to have to be something that someone has intentionally built into that space. Uh, we're not. We really don't want inspectors citing, you know, something like the flower bed, the area next to a flower bed, because they expect someone to walk around and look at the flower bed. That's that's not something that we would consider to be the normal path of travel. So it's a little bit of a difference from uh, the way that we've treated under UPCS. Um, and that's something when we publish this guidance, there will be clear criteria around that. Overgrown vegetation touching a building siding or roof is no longer a defi uh, deficiency. So when we've, you know, cited that in the past, it would be citable under UPCS. Under Inspire, it would be citable if there is another condition present. So let's say there's overgrown vegetation that's damaged part of the roof assembly. There's overgrown vegetation that has, let's say, obstructed a sidewalk. Uh, there's overgrown vegetation that has, uh, you know, led to some other condition that's present. Then it would be citable, but not as overgrown vegetation. Uh, if it's just in contact with the building, not citable. Uh, it has to lead to another condition. Uh, you know, like a big, I think the best example I think we're likely to see uh, is where it's caused damage to the roof, it's caused damage to the siding, or it's caused an obstruction to a sidewalk or a set of stairs, um, you know, those types of conditions that you've observed, that's where I think it's going to be citable, but uh, not citable where it's just in contact with the siding and it hasn't led to another condition that's citable. Does the standard for CO detector include smoke or CO combo units as sufficient for CO detectors or should all CO detectors be standalone? So they don't have to be standalone. Um, you can have combination carbon dioxide and smoke alarms. Um, for those, you would be evaluating those under both standards. So if you find a combo alarm, 
It gets evaluated under the smoke alarm and the carbon dioxide alarm standard. Um, you know, one thing just to be aware of, uh, we talked about this last week, there's a statutory requirement coming. I wanna make sure everyone hears this again. Uh, at the end of 2024, uh, there's a statutory requirement, a congressional mandate that all smoke alarms be smoke alarm units that are sealed with 10-year batteries. So I think in a year and a half, uh, we are likely to counter after that period, you know, there will be some number of those alarms that are not gonna meet that requirement. Not a requirement yet, uh, but that's, that's something to be aware of. Um, I don't think you'll see a lot of combo sealed alarms, um, but we actually might see manufacturers step up and start manufacturing those based on that new law that Congress passed. Uh, so it's entirely possible you'll see some sealed combo units uh, in the future when we have that new requirement, but uh, there's no requirement that they be separate. Uh, they can be combo, that, that's fine. On the test, it states may ask the POA to test. What if they will not? Yeah, so I think the POA should be able to do that. I'll actually we make that uh, I'll make a note of that because that actually we should be asking the POA to do that. Next question. Several, oh, sorry. Uh, several POAs have said that under Inspire there is not a cap on the score for the unit. They are assuming potentially one bad unit could affect the entire score um, adversely. Is that correct? So I think it's, we did some statistical analysis on this. On this. I don't, really unlikely. It's very, very, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's impossible. Statistically improbable, yes. Uh, I mean, you would have to walk into a unit that's in such poor condition that you know, there have to be a substantial number of life-threatening deficiencies in it. Uh, there is a measurement in the scoring uh, notice that basically is an average number of life-threatening deficiencies across the units. Uh, that's the most important measure within the scoring model that we have. Uh, so when properties are thinking about this, I would definitely, I would focus less on a individual unit and more of the average number of life-threatening deficiencies per unit, because it really takes, what we've roughly discovered is that uh, if you have more than one life-threatening deficiency per unit, that's going to fail you. So I wanna make sure that that's clear. Uh, properties wanna have less than one life-threatening deficiency per unit if they wanna pass. Uh, we obviously prefer that they have zero, uh, but if they're thinking about this from a score-based perspective, You've got one, if you average one per unit, you're likely to fail. What if the fire door has magnets and they opened up the doors that covered the elevators? Right, so that's, that's a great question. We have guidance um, in the standard on the inspection process that this should not be evaluated uh, underneath the standard. Uh, we fully understand that there's facilities that have those magnetic locks. Uh, when those are present, um, you know, those are should not be evaluated as something that's preventing the door from closing. What if the door has spring hinges on it and the closer was removed? Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, if it self-closes, um, we wouldn't necessarily consider that to be an issue. Um, That's, uh, you know, because we, we characterize that deficiency criteria within whether or not it's functionally adequate. Um, although that's a really good question. I think we need to go back and check in our um, inspection process, make sure that that's, that's clearly covered. Uh, when we write functionally adequate, we usually write, you know, performs the function of a fire door, which would be closing uh, to slow the spread of fire or smoke, which if it's got that spring on it, we want to make sure that you know if it's got the spring itself closing, um, that's fulfill, that's basically fulfilling that function. If the self closer is missing and it's still closing, you wouldn't really consider that to be an issue. 
but I'll, I'll take a look at their guidance and make sure that we're clear on that. Regarding CO alarms, if the bedroom is serviced by a gas-fired appliance through a vent, why aren't the CO required inside the bedroom as well as outside? So there's multiple dependencies in the uh, International Fire Code. That's basically where we, you know, Congress required us to use the 2018 International Fire Code. Um, that standard basically sets the criteria for where the carbon dioxide alarms are required. Uh, so when we take a look at that. Uh, there are circumstances where, you know, carbon dioxide alarm could be required in a bedroom uh, where, let's you know, say, if they're stuck working in that bedroom and the register's there. Uh, you know, if that if that furnace is in the bedroom and the furnace is in an attached uh, bathroom, it's possible that it could be required there. Uh, the property is going to have options, though, and that's that's because the International Fire Code gives the properties options. Uh, it doesn't say if this fuel burning appliance is present here. Um, you know, it has to be installed in one location. Uh, in our, under the 2018 International Fire Code, there are circumstances where it says if a fuel burning appliance is present in this location, there are multiple options to satisfy our requirement for protection of the unit. Um, having said that, it's entirely possible that it, you know, in the next round of standards or even through a future Federal Register notice, that we could revise those. Uh, but for Inspire, uh, when Congress told us to use this standard, uh, we're going to roll out Inspire with meeting this standard, which is the 2018 International Fire Code. The statute gave us the option of becoming more protective, uh, and that's something that we're considering during the review process of the standards, that triennial review process. So it's entirely possible that the next round of Inspire standards um, in three years would have something that's more protective. Uh, but for the purposes of INSPIRE, we rolled this out to meet the uh, specific criteria of the International Fire Code. Regarding door closers, if the closer has been removed, all evidence, hardware, holes filled, painted, then do we write it up under INSPIRE if we can tell a closer used to be there at some point? Yeah, so if you see that, that's still citable. Uh, deficiency. Um, you know, if, if there's evidence there, you should cite it. Uh, from the property's perspective, we are considering not scoring the fire doors for the first year. Uh, that will be something that's uh, in the uh, scoring notice that comes out soon. Uh, and make sure that if you're talking to properties, they're aware of that. Um, but if there is evidence that a self closer has been removed, you should absolutely say that. But if you, you know, if you cannot determine uh, that, the, that the self closure has been removed, um, I'm not sure how you can actually, how you would take that as evidence. But I think, you know, maybe what you're probably saying is that uh, they may have followed, let's say, the NFPA standard for fire assemblies, fire door assemblies, uh, where they have specific criteria for the repair of fire doors. You know, if you've seen evidence that something like that has occurred, we would consider that to be uh, evidence of hardware that's been removed, specifically a self closure. So that's, if you're seeing that evidence, you should absolutely cite that. What if the bars are openable with no lock or release button on it for the windows? Yeah, so the way that we wrote that is, you know, if we're talking specifically about what we're calling the rescue opening in the bedrooms at the third floor and below, uh, if you have those bars that open, uh, they have self-release or some type of lock that doesn't require a key or specialized knowledge, those should not be citable. Uh, where we typically see those are thumb latches that may have some protective collar over it where someone cannot reach in and open it. Sometimes we say see bars that have uh, some type of internal mechanism that extends sometimes through the wall, through the exterior wall into the inter interior wall where you can actually turn it with a latch. Um, and for those circumstances, not citable. But again, keyed, 
or specialized knowledge, you know, that's still assignable. Do two-pronged outlets have to be tested? Yeah, so for two-pronged outlets, uh, we talked about this earlier, you know, you'll need to carry uh, a voltage detector or a uh, one of those two-prong nominal voltage detectors. Um, you know, when you see those, you want to make sure you check those, make sure the acceptable test for those is just making sure that they're getting voltage. You know, conversely, you could also use a receptacle tester with an adapter. If a unit uh, resident has medical devices within the unit, should we refrain from testing all receptacles to ensure against accidentally disabling the medical devices? Well, again, we, we've specifically restricted this to GFCIs and AFCIs. Uh, once you've entered the unit, you check with the property representative, the POA or PHA, once you've entered the unit to confirm, um, you know, that you know that you are testing these. Uh, and basically confirm if they know which, if, if the equipment is on one of these circuits that contains GFCI or AFCI protection. Uh, once they've made that determination, uh, if they don't want you to test it, then you would not test it. And we'll have this specific criteria uh, listed on the uh, version and on the protocol guide here within the next week. Boiler room have several valves along the pipes that stem from the ACs or boilers unit. Are these valves considered water source? Many unprotected outlets in those rooms, also water heater tank, have a valve in the bottom. Uh, in the bottom, is this a water source? Yeah, so that's a good question. For the intention of the standard, you know, we use the IE, and again, that means we're limited specifically to those items. So that's where we talk about sinks, bathtubs, showers, toilets, those sorts of things. We would not consider a valve on a, you know, connected to a boiler, to a water heater, uh, or even a chiller system, or even say you have a ground source uh, heat pump, that type of condition, that you have that type of HVAC system, not considered a water source. Uh, so I think the other thing you may be referring to here is let's say the temperature pressure release valve tube that comes from a boiler uh, or a water heater, those would not be considered water sources either. Is a missing two-prong light bulb sighted under electrical conductor, even if it's not a standard light bulb? Two-prong light bulb. Um, and so whoever put that in the chat, if you can maybe follow up with something more detailed, because um, I need to, Two-prong light bulb. I think maybe what you're. Uh, I think maybe what you're saying is the two-prong receptacle that gets screwed into an outlet or an, a light socket. I think maybe that's what you're saying. Um, and if that's the case, can you drop that in the chat and let me know? Uh, next question. Panel gap is cur uh, is currently quarter an inch. Is it now half an inch? Yeah, that's correct. It is now half an inch. If low voltage wires are exposed in a utility closet with fuel fired appliance, is this not a, defi a deficiency? Yeah, it's, so Yazi, I just, for some reason your sound is like distant or has an echo. Um, if low voltage wires are exposed in a utility closet with fuel fired appliance, is this not a deficiency? Yeah, so any low voltage wiring is not considered a deficiency. Regarding rust contamination, where exactly should rust be recorded? On the dead front cover, on the exterior cover? Yep, so if you're looking at the dead front cover, uh, you see contamination, um, you know, basically around the breakers, in some way that affects the breakers. Um, you know, so if you, for example, saw rust on the dead front cover, you're looking at the circuit breaker and you see there could be rust on the circuit breaker as well. That's citable. If you see water, you know, rust, and you may see water stains on the circuit breaker, that's something that would be citable as contamination. Uh, you know, if you see paint on the circuit breakers, that's something considered contamination. 
uh, anything on the circuit of the circuit of the circuit breakers measures looking through that opening on the different cover uh, that's something that should be citable as contamination when we try to run the software on windows during the class we were told it is not compatible with windows devices yeah, so I think there is a chance that uh, there is a release uh, that they're working on for the near future here that would be Windows compatible. Uh, I'll confirm that and get back to you. I'm not as connected to the IT as I am some of the other things, but I know the intention in the end with uh, the final release uh, is to you know, probably make this available uh, as many platforms as possible. But I think for the moment, it's only available on iOS and Android. And I'll have to get back to you on whether or not that's going to be a Windows based system or not. If all the doors in the building have painted labels, is it a deficiency? <laughs> so I think if you're saying if there is a 100% of the fire doors uh, that have the labels painted, uh, would you evaluate these as fire doors? So I have a feeling that you know, if you see that condition, uh, you're likely to be able to see uh, at least a few labels uh, where you can see the label uh, and it will be, uh, you know, I think in the professional judgment of the inspector, you'd be able to determine whether or not these are fire labeled doors. You know, if you're, if you, in your professional judgment, looking at all of these fire, fire door labels, you feel that these are fire doors, you, know, you should be setting these as fire doors. Sprinkle, uh, sprinkles head assembly can't be blocked by an item or object within 18 inches of the sprinkler head. If an object like HVAC components are within 18 in inches, will that be cited? Yeah, so on the uh, block sprinkler heads, we've modified the inspection process on that just to make sure that that's clear to everyone. Anything is part of what we consider to be the built environment that could be cabinets, it could be bulkheads, ductwork could be bulkheads for girders, beams, any of those types of things. Uh, would not be citable as an obstructed sprinkler head. It may also be something like a very narrow closet uh, where there may be a sprinkler present that uh, doesn't meet that criteria. We understand that buildings, again, have sprinkler systems that are installed where they're close to items in the built environment, uh, the cabinets or bulkheads. Uh, and part of that process when they had those installed was uh, having that system designed by a professional, having that, that system design reviewed at the state or local level, which they signed off on. You know, so, for, so for things that were part of the built environment, um, you know, that would not make it citable. Can you use a Salesforce app on Android and iPad simultaneously during an Inspire inspection? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll actually have to look to, have to get to our IT, IT people. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, and actually, I'd be told at the moment, no. Uh, so that's something you'll want to. And, and I'm curious under what circumstances that might actually occur. So you may want to. Uh, maybe put some text in the chat about under what circumstances that would happen. The software shows a place for TAC number when an L3 EHNS deficiency is cited. Do we have to call in for a TAC number? Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, sorry, I might not be saying these words right. The software shows a place for TAC number, it's TAC um, pounds. When an uh, L3 EHNS deficiency is cited, do we have to call in for a TAC number? Okay, I'll take a closer look into that. Um, if you're reading that in the app, I need to get an answer for that. Next question is, we have Surface Pro tablets to conduct our um, React. We are finding the program freezes and runs slow every 30 minutes. Is that a software issue? 
Um, I, I'll get back to you. I think that, uh, I think what we're going to do, because I think this is, we're seeing these software questions. Um, I think what we're going to do is towards the end of the dining learns, uh, maybe in a week or two, I think we'll do a software specific session because uh, we are getting a lot of these software questions in. I think at that point we'll uh, we'll have a presentation specifically on the software because um, they you know these are good questions and want to make sure that the people who understand these software questions are on the line. Um, next question, please. If a passive vent system from a fuel-fired appliance is present in a unit, not direct vent, should the piping be a Class B double-walled pipe as required by um, ASHRAE? All right, so per the ASHRAE standard. So uh, the standard that we would really be following under that is the NFPA standard because that's the standard reference in the International Code Council model codes. Um, for a passive vent system, uh, we're not, you know, our standards do not yet get into identification of the of the flue connectors and the flue vent types. Uh, that's something that we would consider in the future version of the standards. Uh, you know, so there are some things that I know that you know, there are maybe some people that are aware of. That's whether or not you're looking at single wall, double wall, triple wall types of vents. Um, you know, and that's another example might be if you're looking at a at a uh, forced air high efficiency furnace, forced air high efficiency water heater. Uh, if you're using non cellular core PVC to vent those, uh, those are things that I know that uh, you know, would not be acceptable under a code inspection or even under a, any other type of property inspections. Uh, those are things that are not yet included underneath the INSPIRE standards. Uh, those are our things that we lo are looking at potentially for the future version of the standards. Uh, so while we you know, basically kick off Inspire, uh, in the background, we're going to be running some other types of uh, demonstrations or feasibility type of inspections to determine if things like these could be included in future versions of the standards. But that's that's really a great question. Uh, I think, you know, we do have this concern about carbon monoxide uh, and making sure that indoor air quality is adequate. Uh, the right type of vent on those fuel burning appliances is critical. Uh, but for the purposes of Inspire, we're checking to make sure that the vents are uh, connected, they have no gaps, they're not loose, uh, and make sure that they are venting. But we're not going to the level of detail of whether or not it is the exact type of vent that should be there or not. Will these PowerPoints be available? And if so, could you please provide a link? Yeah, so we will make these available uh, at, a, at a point in the future. Uh, you know, basically this presentation is gonna take a long time. Uh, I think next week we're gonna try and get through the second part of this. Uh, once we've gotten through the second part of this, we will uh, you know, we'll go through this and actually send it out. And actually, I think by that point, um, we may have published the official version of the web, the web, of the web standards of the web version of the standards. Uh, that those versions of the standards will have more specific information than what I've actually even presented in this demonstration here or this presentation. Uh, so at that point, you'll be able to have gone through the inspection process, uh, be able to look at the details there. At least that's our intent. We uh, I think we'll have this ready by next Wednesday. Uh, so some of the information that's in here uh, will already be posted on the web at that point. Let me jump in just a second, Eric Cliff. Yep. The, uh, the PowerPoints have been converted to a PDF and they are in the uh, React Inspire EPCS training webpage. If you go to it and, and scroll down, Dine and Learn is there. You can click on Dine and Learn. It'll take you to all the Dine and Learns. The one that we did in May, the uh, PDF is available. We also have the YouTube on there from what all uh, Cliff and, and Kevin had to say. The one from last week will be available in the PDF and the YouTube tomorrow or no later than Friday. And the one we're doing tonight will be available uh, probably about this time next week. Thanks, Whit. Um, so we will have, you know, to Whit's point, we'll have these posted uh, after we're done with the second, second uh, 
second part of this. Um, so they will be available. We'll go through this. Uh, we may modify it based on the official version that we post hopefully within this week, but they will be available. We really do intend for everyone to be able to access the web version of these before this session next week. Um, next question. Are all fire doors required to have self-closers? Yeah, so I think when you're looking at a fire door, uh, it's likely that there's going to be evidence of prior installation of a self-closer. And that's typically going to be the installation of the self-closer at the top of the door. Uh, it could also be the spring hinges. You know, typically you might see those in doors that were manufactured in the 40s or 50s uh, prior to the invention and the proliferation of the self-closing arms. Uh, I think that it would be extremely rare to come across a fire-labeled door where that's not uh, where you don't see evidence of the installation of one of those. Um, if it's not there, if you don't see visual evidence, uh, I'm just trying to think how that's possible. Uh, I certainly think there's a probably some, you know, one out of a hundred thousand or ten thousand type of circumstance where that's possible. Um, you know, I think under the way the standards written, that may not be citable. Uh, in future versions of the uh, software and of the app, uh, we're going to have the ability uh, to basically provide some input where you see some, you know, what we call some one-offs, maybe something that's even more than a one-off. Uh, and if you see something like that, uh, you don't think it's it could be captured under the standard, uh, I want to make sure that we have a way to actually provide some, some feedback. So we, we know that they got removed. Um, and I think, uh, you know, our expectation is there would be evidence that they were previously there. Um, you know, that's not the case. Uh, if you have some pictures of those, I'd actually love to see them. Uh, next question. How many inspectable items are in Inspire standards or associated with building code? Yeah, so at least for Inspire, we largely try to align this with the International Property Maintenance Code. This isn't going to be a 100% match. There's some things that are different. You know, like our minimum temperature standard is, you know, basically um, aligns with it. We have a lower temperature that's actually lower than the IPMC, for example. Um, and that's largely based on uh, public health research. Uh, there's some things that are maybe a, a little bit more prescriptive. Some of those are, for example, the carbon dioxide alarm requirements and the smoke alarm standards and the smoke alarm requirements. And that's because those are statutory requirements where Congress uh, required us to use some of the most recent versions of the model codes. Uh, there could be some, some things that are, you know, basically uh, pretty close, such as, uh, you know, egress, fire doors, those sorts of things. Uh, but I think we're largely aligning with the International Property Maintenance Code. And that's because we know that that's used within, I think, close to 900 local jurisdictions. And it's used by, I think, approximately 42 to 44 states as their, pro as their housing code, or as their property maintenance code. Uh, yeah, so in that way, we know that if what we're writing into INSPIRE aligns with the International Property Maintenance Code, or if it's a close alignment with it, then we're not in conflict uh, with a lot of the state and local codes. Are thumb latches okay on aluminum windows for INSPIRE? So I think the thumb latch you're talking about, you know, if it's something that can be opened with a, um, with a hand but it doesn't have a any type of lock, key to lock into it, or any specialized knowledge to use it should be acceptable. Um, I want to make sure that I understand exactly what it is you're talking about. Um, if you get a chance, uh, you, can inspire, you can email us at inspirehub.gov with a picture or any additional text, but I uh, want to make sure that that's something we're clear on. On slide 19, you show a screw hole in a window with no screw. However, it is listed as a blocked egress. Um, does this mean the property, in addition to removing the screw, must fill the hole? So I, maybe my vision is not very good, but <clears throat> for slide 19, let's go back.
Okay. I think there's a screw there. Um, at least that's the intent of it when we, when we had that picture. So if there is, under those circumstances, we didn't, we had a screw, um, a screw hole, but no screw, that's not blocked. Uh, when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing this, you know, we basically used this as an example because we thought there was a screw there. That almost looks like a rivet, but uh, looks like the head of maybe like a pan head screw. Uh, that's what it looks like to me because I, I don't think that's a fluted screw. Uh, it looks more like a pan head screw. Maybe because the way it's not sitting proud of the frame there, looks like it's seated flush with the uh, frame. So I think that's maybe a pan head screw and it just looks like maybe there's just a screw hole there. Uh, but, if, you know, to your point, if there's just a screw hole there, not sideable. If there is a screw in the screw hole, yes, that's sideable. And I'll take this last question here. Will properties that have hardwired smoke detectors be required to switch to the 10-year sealed battery detectors? Yeah, that's a good question. So when that statute takes effect in 2025, um, sorry, 2024, um, if a property has a hardwired smoke alarm present, um, that smoke alarm would also need to have a 10-year sealed battery in the unit. So for properties that only have hardwired smoke alarms, um, you know, they would need to replace those with hardwired, you know, so this is assuming that their local jurisdiction requires them to have hardwired units. Uh, if, their if their local jurisdiction requires hardwired units that are, you know, hardwired or hardwired and interconnected, uh, they would need to replace those units with hardwired units that have 10 year sealed batteries as well. Uh, so I think there is some confusion about that, but uh, where they only have hardwired alarm units, uh, they would, and the local jurisdiction requires that to be present, it would need to be replaced with a hardwired unit with sealed 10-year batteries. All right, and I appreciate the questions tonight. Those are all great questions. Uh, we'll take a close look at the questions we weren't able to answer and we'll compile those into questions that we intend to answer later. And I'll turn this back over to you, Whit. Thank you, Cliff. This has been very informative for me and I'm sure it has for uh, all of you also. Uh, like I say, check the, uh, the Dine and Learn. When you get a chance, I put the link in here in the chat so that you can have it to go to it if you don't know where it's at. So go there and look at what we've done on these and uh, get familiar with them because all this is new to all of us. And, and like Cliff is saying, uh, things are changing as we're speaking on these and then coming out with new stuff. So uh, you're going to be learning with the rest of us. Anyway, I appreciate everybody that showed up on this. I uh, hope to see you again next week, and I'm going to close it out. And good night. That concludes tonight's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.